99% of developers don't get the Poisson distribution. If you were like me, discrete math was one of those non-core computer science classes that you had to take in first or second year that you absolutely hated. But the more I learned, the more I started to see the beauty of it all. If you're French, you might know that Poisson means fish. So you'd expect this concept in probability theory and statistics to be related to the mass distribution of fish, like salmon or Atlantic cod. But no, you're actually wrong. Poisson distribution is one of those concepts like Lagrange multipliers, Jacobian matrices, or Taylor series that you may have heard of in passing, or may have come across in a lecture, but that you simply have zero recollection of. And that may be a problem, right? You should take the time to at least understand some of these core math principles because although you don't need to know math to be a good developer, it certainly does help to reason logically about things. So in this video, I'm going to explain to you what a Poisson distribution is. The Poisson distribution is incredibly versatile. Let's say you want to compute the number of mutations in a DNA strand after exposure to radiation. Or you want to find the number of bacteria in a small sample of water, the number of radioactive decay events from a substance in a given minute, or the number of photons hitting a detector in a particle physics experiment. This is where the Poisson distribution shines. Now as always, in order to start to understand a new concept, you want to begin with a concrete definition. At its core, the Poisson distribution is a discrete probability distribution. Discrete just means that it deals with outcomes that are countable, rather than measurable on a continuous scale like height or weight. Specifically, it helps us answer the following question. What is the probability of a given number of events happening in a fixed interval of time or space if these events occur with a known constant average rate and independently of the time since the last event? You can think of it as the go-to tool for modeling the occurrence of relatively rare events over a specified duration or area. But to understand when to use the Poisson distribution, you have to consider a couple key components. First are events. These are the occurrences of what you're counting. For example, a customer arriving, a machine failing, or a typo on a page. Next is the interval. This is a fixed and well-defined period of time, for example, an hour, day, or month, or a region of space, for example, a square meter, a liter of liquid, or a page of text. And then there's this Greek letter lambda, which is the known constant average rate. You need to know or be able to estimate the average number of times an event occurs within that specific interval. It's important to note that this rate is assumed to be constant throughout the interval. And next, you have independence. The occurrence of one event must not affect the probability of another event occurring. For example, a customer arriving now shouldn't make another customer more or less likely to arrive in the next minute. And the final concept is non-simultaneous events. Two events cannot occur at precisely the same instant. There's always some, however small, time or space separating them. The magic of the Poisson distribution lies in its formula, known as the probability mass function, or PMF. So essentially it answers the question, if events happen randomly at a certain average rate, what is the likelihood of observing exactly k of these events within a defined window? Its core function is to quantify the randomness associated with events that occur independently and at a constant average rate. By calculating these probabilities, we can predict the likelihood of different event counts. For example, determine how probable it is to observe 0, 1, or 2, or any other number of events. Understand the variability around the average, so we can see how much the actual number of events might deviate from the expected average rate. As boring as it may sound, based on the probabilities, we can assess risks, plan resources, or evaluate the significance of observed event counts. If you are interested in taking your software engineering skills to the next level, I would encourage you to build projects. I'm not talking about going down the rabbit hole of tutorial hell and building a to-do list, calculator, or weather app. I'm talking about building complex, real-world projects beyond the basics. And this is where Codecrafters comes in. This platform provides interactive tools to build developer tooling from scratch. There are a number of courses that teach building Git from scratch, building an in-memory Redis database, an HTTP web server, your own Docker, your own DNS server, and many others. I personally love that there is built-in support for over 20 different languages. My favorite, of course, is Golang, but I would highly recommend trying a newer language like Zig as well. I'm excited to announce that I'm partnering with Codecrafters to offer all my viewers 40% off. For more details, you can find a link in the description down below as well as the pinned comment. So here is the formula, perhaps a bit scary looking. This is the probability we want to calculate, the probability that the random variable x, which represents the number of events, is equal to a specific count k. k is the number of occurrences of the event you're interested in. 
It's a non-negative integer. For example, what's the probability of exactly three calls? Here we can set k equals three. Lambda is the average rate of event occurrences within the given interval. It's the core of the distribution and the only parameter. For example, if a call center receives an average of 10 calls per hour, then lambda equals 10 for that one hour interval. E is Euler's number, which is a fundamental mathematical constant approximately equal to 2.71828. It appears naturally in processes involving continuous growth or decay. And k factorial is the product of all positive integers up to k. For example, 5 factorial is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 or 120. And for k equals 0, 0 factorial is defined as 1. The mean or mu is the average or expected number of events in an interval, and it is simply equal to lambda. The variance or sigma squared measures the spread or dispersion of the data around the mean. For the Poisson distribution, the variance is also equal to lambda. So the variance is the spread around the mean. It tells us how much the actual number of events we observe in different intervals tends to deviate from this average. Because the events are independent and the rate is constant, the variability in the count is directly tied to how many events we expect on average. If we expect more events, or a larger lambda, there is naturally more room for the actual count to fluctuate away from that higher average. Conversely, if we expect fewer events or a smaller lambda, the fluctuations around that lower average will be smaller. Think of it like this, if you expect to receive two emails per hour, the actual number in any given hour might be 0, 1, 2, 3, or maybe even 4. The spread, or variance, isn't huge, but if you expect to receive 20 emails per hour, the actual number could range much more widely, perhaps 10 to 40 or beyond. The higher the average, the greater the potential for deviation. So the equality of mu or mean equals sigma squared or variance equals lambda or rate. So the shape of the distribution is another factor. For small values of lambda, for example, lambda less than five, the distribution is noticeably right skewed. What that means is it has a longer tail on the right side. This makes sense. If the average is low, you can't have fewer than zero events, but you could occasionally have more than average. As lambda increases, for example, lambda greater or equals to 10 or 20, the distribution becomes more symmetrical and starts to resemble a normal or Gaussian distribution. In fact, for large lambda, the normal distribution can be used as an approximation to the Poisson distribution. Let's take a look at a bit of a contrived example, spontaneous mutations in a gene. Imagine a biologist is studying a specific gene in a species of yeast. This particular gene is crucial for a certain metabolic pathway. From extensive research, the biologist knows the following, the interval. They are looking at this gene across one cell generation. How about the average rate, or lambda? Under normal laboratory conditions, let's say, without exposure to mutagens, this specific gene acquires spontaneous mutations at an average rate of lambda equals 0.005 mutations per gene per cell generation. This is a very low average, meaning mutations in this specific gene are rare in any single generation, which is typical for maintaining genetic stability. Now onto the more interesting questions. What is the probability that after one cell generation, this specific gene will have exactly zero new spontaneous mutations, meaning it's perfectly copied? What is the probability that it will have exactly one new spontaneous mutation? And what is the probability that it will have two or more new spontaneous mutations? This could be more impactful on the gene's function. Recall the Poisson formula. Here, lambda is 0 0.005. Euler's number is approximately 2.71828. We compute e to the minus lambda, which is 0.995. For the probability of zero mutations, we set k to zero. Lambda to the kth power is one. And k factorial is zero factorial, which equals one. This means that there is a 99.5% chance that this specific gene will be perfectly replicated with no new spontaneous mutations in a single cell generation. And in this specific case, it highlights the high fidelity of DNA replication and repair mechanisms in cells, though this is a fairly contrived example. Similarly, we can compute the probability of exactly one mutation, or k equals 1. There is a 0.498% chance, or about 1 in 200, that the gene will acquire exactly one new spontaneous mutation. While low, these single mutations are the raw material for evolution. If this mutation occurs in a critical part of the gene, it could alter the protein it codes for and potentially lead to a change in the yeast's traits. And for the probability of two or more mutations, we calculate this by finding the probability of zero or one mutations and subtracting from one. So there is an approximately 0.0013% chance, or about one in 77,000, that the gene will acquire two or more new spontaneous mutations in a single generation. While extremely rare for a specific gene in one generation, 
If you consider the vast number of genes in an organism and many generations in a population, such events, though individually improbable, do occur and can sometimes lead to more significant functional changes or even be deleterious. So why is this case study interesting? It reflects the reality that DNA replication is highly accurate, but imperfect. Even very low probabilities of mutation when scaled up across populations and geological time provide the genetic variation upon which natural selection acts. Let's say this biologist exposes the yeast to a mutagen, like UV radiation or certain chemicals, the average mutation rate or lambda would increase. They could then use the Poisson distribution to predict the higher probabilities of observing 0, 1, or more mutations, which quantifies the mutagen's impact. The Poisson distribution is also the limit of a binomial distribution, for which the probability of success for each trial equals lambda divided by the number of trials as the number of trials approaches infinity. But that's a bit hard to follow, so let me give you an analogy. Imagine you're watching a busy street corner. You want to count how many red cars drive by in an hour. We start with the binomial distribution. Let's break that hour down into tiny, tiny moments, so small that you can almost think of them as individual trials. In each of these tiny moments, either a red car drives by or it doesn't. Let's say you initially divide the hour into 60 one-minute intervals, or 60 trials. There's a small chance a red car passes in each minute. Now imagine dividing the hour into 3,600 one-second intervals, so many more trials. The chance of a red car passing in each specific second becomes even smaller. Keep making those intervals smaller and smaller so you have an incredibly large number of trials, and the probability of success, for example a red car passing, in each tiny trial becomes incredibly small. I'm actually describing to you what a limit is. The limit of the binomial distribution is the Poisson distribution. So what happens as you make those tiny moments infinitely small and the number of them infinitely large? Even though the chance of a red car appearing in any single infinitesimally small moment is practically zero, over the entire hour you still expect a certain average number of red cars to drive by. That average number is what we call lambda. You can think of it like a smoothed out version of the binomial distribution. Recall the binomial distribution which describes the number of successes k in a fixed number n of independent trials, where each trial has the same probability of success p. Here's the probability mass function for a binomial distribution. And don't let this fancy probability mass function term scare you. It just gives you the probability for each specific countable outcome of a random event. This term is the number of combinations or the ways to choose k successes from n trials. P is the probability of success on a single trial, and 1 minus P is the probability of failure on a single trial. To get from binomial to Poisson, we imagine the following conditions. You have a large number of trials, so n goes to infinity. We divide the continuous interval into very, very large number of tiny subintervals or trials, and then you want to put a small probability of success in each trial, so P towards 0. And finally, the mean number of events remains constant and finite. This is referring to lambda, by the way. So even though n is huge and p is tiny, their product, n times p equals lambda, stays constant. This lambda is the average number of events we expect in the overall interval, so we can say p equals lambda over n. Now we substitute p equals lambda over n into the binomial formula, and let's see what happens when n gets infinitely large. There's a little bit of algebraic manipulation and calculus, specifically limits, so let's start with the term 1, or the combinations term. The number of ways to choose k successes from n trials can be given by the following. As n approaches infinity, all the terms in the numerator, n, n minus 1, n minus k plus 1, behave like n. So this part approximates to n to the power of k over k factorial. The second term is p to the power of k. Remember that p equals lambda over n, so this becomes lambda to the k over n to the k. Term 3 is 1 minus p to the power of n minus k. We substitute p equals lambda over n, and we get 1 minus lambda over n, all to the power of n minus k. Remember, we have a large number of trials, so as n approaches infinity, the minus k in the exponent becomes insignificant compared to n. So this approximates to 1 minus lambda over n, all to the power of n. And this is a very famous limit in calculus. As n approaches infinity, the limit of 1 plus x over n, all to the power of n, is e to the x, and in our case, x equals minus lambda. So 1 minus lambda over n, all to the power of n, is equal to Euler's number to the minus lambda. By combining all of these limiting forms, we notice that the n to the k term cancels out, and we are left with, oh, that's the Poisson distribution formula. 
If you learned something new in this video, please subscribe to this channel and turn on post notifications if you want to be notified for future updates, and I would greatly appreciate it if you left this video a like. As always, thank you very much for watching and happy coding!